So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, which we have called Taking Justice Online. So is this the new phase of dispute resolution? So that's really the question that we are trying to address today with, with our panelists. The webinar is organized by LMS, Legal, LLP, and by the Franco-British Lawyer Society. So I will give you a very brief introduction on what we do at the society and uh, our main activities for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with what we do. And then I will hand over to my co-panelist, co-facilitator, uh, Mia Forbes-Piri, who will give you sort of a, a, a few words about today's events. And um, as Mia will explain in more detail, we will be facilitating this uh, sort of event today in a somewhat uh, new format for, for the society. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so first of all, the, the FBLS, the Franco-British Lawyer Society was established about 30 years ago. And from its very inception, the real objective has always been to promote uh, effective cooperation between the United Kingdom and France, and more specifically between their respective legal systems. So in addition to being present very strongly in France and in England and Wales, we have a very uh, strong committee in Scotland and a very strong committee in Northern Ireland as well and we do interact very regularly amongst all our uh, committee members. And uh, one of the key aspects, of course, is the combination of the civil law and common law uh, aspects of, of, uh, of the law. Uh, today, for example, we're going to discuss the use of online hearings in the uh, arbitration context, amongst other uh, contexts. And arbitration, in addition to being my own field of, of expertise, is also one of the emblem of the civil law, common law sort of uh, dynamic uh, or combination or divide as, as, may, uh, some, as some may want to call it. So at this society, we organize uh, flagship events such as the annual colloquium and our biannual uh, maritime law colloquium. And we, also organize more sort of ad hoc events, which may be repeated or which may just happen once. And that's just because we practice law in very different settings, in very different forms. And so we bring to the society our uh, different perspectives. Most recently, uh, we have, of course, all been facing uh, the uncertainties around the UK exiting the European Union. And so we have been holding a series of seminars on, uh, of course, Brexit and the key aspects, practical aspects of, of Brexit. So uh, I think we've had two so far and we're going to have more. So of course, please join us for, for the future ones. And uh, lastly, I would like to say that uh, as we have just started going into lockdown in the UK, uh, but also uh, France has started its second lockdown last week. And I know many of you are not actually connecting from the UK or France. Uh, I just wanted to sort of share with you our, our situation here. So I assume everybody has also gone online with their professional, personal life. At the society, similarly, we have taken all our events online. And so that sort of brings us quite nicely into the uh, topic of today's debate and seminar. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to my co-panelist, uh, Mia Forsbiri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for taking the time to be here with us. We're talking, obviously, today about taking justice online, which is a very important topic. And we're going to have different perspectives. We are very fortunate to have Lord Lloyd-Jones who will open for us and then we have different panelists with different specializations to give you different thoughts on various aspects of taking justice online. So I myself am sort of focusing on mediation, um, Annalisa Day focusing <laughs> more on arbitration and uh, court hearings uh, Jason Galbraith-Martin will be focusing 
on witnesses and witness training and also on uh, hearings and Leo Carpentieri is our solicitor and is involved in arbitrations as well as hearings. So we have all of those different perspectives and we'll begin with the judicial perspective. And we're trying out a different format, which hopefully is intended to be a much more relaxed and conversational format, which is unusual for FBLS. So fingers crossed it will work out well. Um, it may not, so pl please feel free to give us feedback. Um, we want you to be as involved as possible. And obviously the webinar format doesn't give you that possibility of being as involved as, as in a different context if we were live. Uh, but please use the Q&A function that you can probably see hopefully at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And feel free to use the chat function to ask questions and comment as well. We will do our best to keep up with what you send in. We might not manage to cover everything. This is being recorded, so obviously uh, we will read out what you say. And if you want to make it anonymous, you can. There is that option. Or otherwise, we'll probably read out your name and your question. Um, so we're going to try our best to make this a very interactive uh, relaxed session, which hopefully will make it more engaging for you all. Um, so yes, please give us feedback at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lord Lloyd-Jones, who is, as I'm sure you all know, a judge at the Supreme Court. He hasn't always been a judge at the Supreme Court, obviously, like all of us. And since at FBLS we have a career forum uh, in a couple of weeks, I want to inspire the younger people or, and inspire you to get people to come to our careers forum by saying that Lord Lloyd-Jones started out at Pontypris grammar school for boys. Um, so quite a few years ago now. And I think that's, I find that very inspiring that he's now on our Supreme Court. Along the way, as a lawyer, he was part of uh, the legal proceedings around Bloody Sunday, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, and I believe that he is also a Welsh speaker as he was chairman of the Lord Chancellor's Standing Committee on the Welsh language. But I think he'll be speaking to us in English today, not in not in Welsh, because uh, very few people uh, speak Welsh, which actually is why it was used in in wars. The Welsh Guard used to speak on uh, on radio in Welsh so that they didn't have to code and uncode. But we are very fortunate to have him here today. And he's going to talk to us about his experience at the Supreme Court um, in taking justice online. So I hand over to you, Lord Lloyd-Jones. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for the invitation to join the seminar this morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And I bring the warm greetings from my colleagues in the Supreme Court. <clears throat> Very similar challenges are confronting legal systems across Europe, across the world. In particular, how to enable the machinery of justice to continue to function and how to maintain the administration of justice in the face of the unprecedented difficulties caused by the pandemic. And this seminar provides an excellent opportunity for us to exchange information and views as to the possible ways in which we can meet the challenge to consider how it's working. So I welcome this opportunity to say something about how we're dealing with the problem in the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. And I look forward to hearing from the other speakers how the challenge is being met elsewhere. Perhaps I might start by saying something about the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and how it operates in normal times. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom is, of course, the final court of appeal for the three jurisdictions in the United Kingdom, England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. In addition, the justices of the Supreme Court also sit as the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is a legacy of the days when we had an empire. It was once the final court of appeal for the entire British Empire. Today, it's the final court of appeal for 27 jurisdictions. Some independent states, such as Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius, and some British overseas territories. So we hear appeals, for example, from the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, the Bahamas, Cayman Islands, and so on. And the same 12 justices sit in both courts. And the Privy Council provides about one third of our caseload. 
All of our cases are appellate cases, so we're not concerned at all with witnesses. We simply hear legal argument. We occupy a building in Parliament Square in London, which is usually a very busy place. Uh, in addition to the 12 justices of the Supreme Court and our personal and judicial assistants, it houses a chief executive, registrar, and their support staff. We have three courtrooms, two for the Supreme Court, and one used more commonly for the Privy Council, and these are in frequent use. The building is also a, a major tourist attraction in normal times. Uh, in the year to March 2020, we welcomed 75,832 visitors, most of whom sat in the public gallery when the hearings were taking place. I have to say, um, some of the visit, most of the visitors don't last for very long in the, in the gallery when they're listening to the legal argument, uh, but some will stick it out all day. And in addition, all of our hearings are normally live streamed, and in the year to March 2020, they were viewed by an audience of 386,000 people. On the afternoon of Wednesday, the 18th of March of this year, however, at the conclusion of the second day of an appeal in the Supreme Court, the building fell silent. While the normal schedule of hearings had continued up to that point, undisturbed by the approach of the COVID-19 virus, it then became clear that we could no longer safely continue to hear appeals in the normal way. The last case in which I sat in the building was a Privy Council appeal on the 17th of March. And I confess that as I left the uh, Supreme Court that evening, I took a last look around, wondering how long it might be before my colleagues and I would all assemble there once again. The justices and staff were determined that the court should continue to function openly and effectively during the pandemic. Accordingly, in the days which followed, our small IT team set up the technology required for the court to operate entirely remotely by video conferencing. They provided training to the justices and the relevant staff and rehearsals were held over the weekend. And remarkably, and this is a direct result, I think, of the technical ability and hard work of the IT team and the other support staff, uh, the Supreme Court was able to hold its first virtual hearing on Tuesday the 24th of March. It was a very busy weekend indeed. Uh, we were assisted by the fact that prior to the pandemic, hearings by video link had been used on a few occasions in Privy Council appeals where the time zones were suitable and the technology was available locally, particularly appeals from Trinidad and Tobago and Mauritius. Although it was necessary in March to adjourn some Supreme Court hearings because council were unwell and some Privy Council hearings because of other local problems, the transition worked pretty smoothly and with only minimal disruption to the hearing and the disposal of appeals. As a result, we, we do not have a backlog of cases as a result of the virus. All 34 appeals heard by the Supreme Court and the Privy Council between the 24th of March and the 31st of July were heard virtually. In a virtual hearing, the justices take part from their homes and counsel participate from their homes or their chambers. All of these hearings are live streamed so as to maintain public access to the hearings. As far as possible, the hearings follow the normal pattern, but there are inevitably modifications. Arrangements have been made for the justices to discuss the cases in private video conferences before, during and after the hearing. In addition to written guidance on the arrangements for a virtual hearing, the presiding justice will immediately before the start of each appeal, hold a video conference with counsel to explain how the technology will be used at the hearing. Throughout the hearing, one member of the IT staff will monitor the hearing and a second will monitor the live feed. While previously some of the justices had used electronic bundles at hearings, Others had preferred to use hard copies, which they could annotate. And I was one, I admit, who preferred to have hard copies of authorities so that I could mark them up ready for judgment writing. At the lockdown, however, uh, we all adapted immediately to the use of electronic bundles accessed remotely 
We had to because there, there was no possibility of distributing hard copy bundles. Our court became paperless virtually overnight of necessity. And that has been one of the greatest challenges, so far as I'm concerned, managing an electronic bundle of perhaps 12,000 pages during the hearing. But I have become quite proficient at it, I think. In the early days of the virtual hearings, counsel were not able to see all of the members of the court, but only the justice who was speaking at any one time. Counsel told us that this made it difficult to gauge the response of the court, and as a result, the system was changed so that all of the members of the court are visible to counsel throughout. From the point of view of the public, the experience of watching a hearing as it's live streamed is inevitably rather different from attending a hearing in person. But we meet our commitment to the accessibility of our hearings by continuing to live stream the hearing in every case. There's not the same spontaneity of interaction between counsel and the members of the court as in a real hearing. Because of technical requirements, in particular muting, we judges have to put our hands up if we want to ask a question. The Supreme Court has also continued to hand down its judgments, although uh, during this period, this has generally involved one of the justices pre-recording an explanation of the judgment and then streaming the recording on the court's website. Uh, between the 24th of March and the 19th of August 2020, 27 Supreme Court judgments and 13 Privy Council judgments were delivered. Um, and uh, more recently, um, in, in recent weeks, uh, since the start of this term, the beginning of October, uh, we've adopted a new system whereby the hand downs of judgments are done live. So I handed one down last Friday morning and I'll be handing down another one this, com this coming Friday morning. Uh, whereas at first we recorded the hand downs, we're now doing those live once again. There is, of course, a great deal of other work involved in operating the court. For example, processing and deciding applications for permission to appeal and other applications to the court that can be decided without an oral hearing. And that has continued using video conferencing and teleconferencing in place of face-to-face -face meetings between the justices. Since the lockdown, uh, three new justices have been appointed to the Supreme Court, Lord Leggett, Lord Burroughs and Lord Stevens. And in normal circumstances, swearing in ceremonies take place in courtroom one, which is usually packed for the occasion. The full court, the family and friends of the new justice and senior members of the legal community. The lockdown, of course, made this impossible. And as a result, Lord Leggett and Lord Burroughs took their oaths in closed ceremonies in the presence of our president, Lord Reed, in the library at the Supreme Court, while the other justices, the rest of us all took place or took part remotely by video conference. And when circumstances allow, a further ceremony will be held at which Lord Leggett and Lord Burroughs uh, will renew their oaths of office. In the case of Lord Stevens, who was sworn in on the 1st of October, it was possible for the court to convene. We all convened in courtroom one, for a socially distanced ceremony. It's not clear when it will be possible to resume hearings in the Supreme Court building. Um, when that happens, however, it would be a great pleasure to be able to work once again in our splendid building and to enjoy the company of our colleagues, albeit at a distance. The recent months have been very challenging for the Supreme Court that we've been able to perform our functions fully during this period has been due in large measure to the skill, diligence and enterprise of the court staff. They were recently paid a, a great compliment by Professor Richard Suskind in an article published by the Harvard Law School. He said this, I quote, it's to the great credit of the UK Supreme Court that it so quickly moved its entire caseload from physical to video hearings and did so as effectively as any other Supreme Court that is noted on remote courts worldwide. Indeed, I would say that the UK Supreme Court has responded more emphatically and successfully than any of its equivalents internationally. Thanks to technology, perseverance and judicial adaptability, access to the highest court in the United Kingdom has been maintained during the crisis." End of quote. So 
we've been very fortunate, I have to say. Uh, we've been able to keep the show on the road and the rate of our hearings has not been significantly affected by the pandemic. We have no backlog of cases as a result of the pandemic. Um, we hope that it will not be long before more normal conditions will be restored and that we'll be able to return to our normal mode of functioning in the Supreme Court building. And I confess that I, I greatly miss working alongside my colleagues there. However, when we do, I think we will find that we've benefited in some ways from the experience. I think it's likely that in future all justices will make more use of electronic bundles than we have previously. I also think that it's likely we will continue to use hearings by video link for Privy Council cases more frequently than we did before the pandemic. So some good may have come out of this unhappy period. Thank you so much, Lord Lloyd-Jones, for that wonderful, wonderful opening. Um, so interesting to hear the challenges that the court faced and how well it has dealt with those challenges from sort of the immense preparation. And I was incredibly impressed by how there's no backlog at all. Um, I was just wondering, are there I mean, you said that judges now have to raise their hand to ask a question. <laughs> Does that, does that change the dynamic at all in the courtroom? It does a little bit. It's, um, as you know, normally during a hearing, we feel pretty free to interrupt counsel in, in full flow. Uh, as it is, we, we, during the hearing, the president will not be muted, m muted, but the other members of the court are usually muted because it stops the technical problem of, of, of background noise. Um, so if we want to ask a question, we can't just interrupt. We have to be unmuted. We can either unmute ourselves or the technician in charge of the proceedings can unmute us, but we find the best way to do it is to put our hands up. And uh, sometimes um, so, some of my colleagues have to wait quite a long time before counsel, <laughs> counsel will respond. They want to finish the point that they're, that they're making. That's definitely it, very it's, different. It's not, a, it's not a spontaneous. Yeah. Uh, as it would otherwise be, but it doesn't stop us asking questions. Yeah, so, so there's, there's that spontaneity that's lost and, and yes, you have to wait for a while, which, which is quite, quite different. Um, I was just also wondering, you said that you missed sort of physical bundles and, and I, I think uh, I said this to you before, but I feel that I, I'm not sure I could work with electronic bundles the way you all do, so I find that very impressive. Is there anything else that you miss in a sort of courtroom setting um, since the pandemic, now that we're online? Yes, well, I, I, do, I do miss the bundles, certainly. Um, is it, I find it so much easier when I'm writing a judgment to have copies of the, the bundles of authorities, which, which, I've, which I've marked up, marked the relevant passages and so on. Of course, I can mark, mark them online, but it, if, if, if I've not got the hard copies, it does take longer to write the judgments, no, no doubt about that. It does take a lot longer to do that. Um, what else do I miss? Um, well, I miss just being in the building with my colleagues. I mean, I'm, we're very fortunate. It's a very happy court. We all get on extremely well. And um, there are lots of meetings in the corridor, discussions on the side of cases, maybe about the case or maybe about law generally or maybe gossip or, or, or whatever. Um, but it's simply just being there and working with uh, my colleagues is the thing I miss the most. Thank you so much, indeed. And it's very kind of you to, to want to stay with us. And he may uh, decide to pop back and interject at some point or to ask a question or, or more likely to give us a comment uh, on his perspective. So thank you very much. I feel almost rude demoting you to attendee now, <laughs> but, but it has been arranged. So thank you very, very much. We thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, how do I... Uh, just moving you to change role to attendee. There we go. We have all these little technical things on Zoom. Wonderful. So hopefully you're now seeing the four of us who are panelists and facilitators um, online. And I think I just would like everyone to, to begin by introducing themselves and maybe uh, sort of starting where we just left off saying, one thing that you miss either personally or professionally since the pandemic um, and a bit about your experience in this transition 
moving online. Uh, so uh, if we unmute ourselves, who would like to go first? I'll go first, uh, Mia, happily. Um, so I am Jason Galbraith Martin. I am a QC. And so I am in full time practice as a barrister. I specialize in employment litigation. But I also run, um, in addition to being a barrister, I run a company that specializes in witness training. And so I've been involved both helping to prepare witnesses who are giving evidence at courts and tribunals around the world, not just in the UK. Uh, and also in arbitration. So I've got particular experience on that side of things, as well as having appeared in a number of courts and tribunals as an advocate. And that's at every stage from the first instance employment tribunal up to and including the Supreme Court. I've done a hearing in the Supreme Court, not, I have to say, in front of um, Lord Lloyd Jones. Although I do echo everything he said about how smoothly hearings run in the Supreme Court. And whilst he's listening, I can add, um, it certainly is the experience of counsel in the earlier cases, mine was heard in July, so a few months ago now, but certainly the experience of counsel that the justices tend to interrupt a little less um, remotely than they would do in person. Now, the jury's out on whether that's a good or a bad thing. I think as barristers, it's always quite nice to be able to get on and make your point and not be interrupted particularly as our oral submissions are quite tightly timetabled. So the more interjections that there are, the, the less time you've got actually to make your points. But the downside is that uh, the interjections from the justices, more, I think more so in the Supreme Court than in any other court, really give you an indication of what they're thinking and an opportunity to, to respond if they're not really clear or sure about a point you're making. And so the lack of the interruption or the interjection from the justices has that, that negative impact. You can't, it's much harder to read the court and get a sense of where they're going. So that's my experience. What do I miss most? Um, crowd noise at sporting events, I think. <laughs> crowd noise at sporting events. Without crowd noise, it's just not the same. I watched the France Island match over the weekend and it was like watching a training session between, between school kids without the crowd noise. And I don't think the video, the, the, the piped in crowd noise works at all it's like watching a video game so i miss crowd noise at sporting events that's me thank you very much jason who wants to go next i'm happy to go i'm annalisa day qc i'm a barrister at fountain court chambers and i have a bit of a split personality because i spend 50 percent of my time in court um in the UK, in England, but also in the DIFC and in Singapore, international commercial courts. And then I spend the other 50% of my time in arbitration, both in England and around the world, in the Middle East, um, in uh, the Far East, etc. So I have um, been spending a lot of time at home rather than traveling. Uh, which has its benefits and its uh, drawbacks. But I've actually been doing a lot of hearings um, online. I've done a few hybrid hearings as well, which we may want to talk about because they present their own challenges. Um, but I've been fortunate to do both hearings that involve submissions, such as you um, take part in the Supreme Court, but also some full trials and hearings involving cross-examination of witnesses and experts, which I'm sure we will talk about in more detail later. What do I miss? I miss hugs uh, from people, hugging people who aren't my children, particularly my parents, but also my friends. Um, I don't tend to hug people in court, but you never know, we might all be into hugging as well as interrupting in court. And I do miss the interrupting a bit, I must say, um, talking at a screen and I miss seeing all of you in an event like this, you can't see and participate in the same way with people, but hopefully the technology will keep on moving. And I think, I think again, we'll talk about this later, but I think things never stand still and it's good to embrace the good and work out how to deal with the not so good. Fantastic. Thank you, Annalisa. Leo, do you want to go next? Sure. Thank you, Mia. Uh, so I'm Leo Carpentieri. I am counsel of LMS uh, Legal LP. I've been practicing arbitration in uh, London primarily and a little bit in Paris at the beginning of my career uh, about 10 years ago. 
So I'm a French uh, avocat and a solicitor here. And uh, I don't have a split personality professionally, maybe I do in my other lives, but I do mainly arbitration and uh, my focus is really energy construction disputes. Um, my practice is really a little bit split between commercial disputes and more investment treaty disputes. And I have to say that my experience in online hearing so far has been very, very positive, although that sort of is limited to the hearing itself because we're still waiting for what's happening and the actual words. So we'll see how that goes. But um, I would say one thing that's uh, quite specific that doesn't happen in online hearings that happens in real life is potentially the interaction between within the legal team, but also between the legal team and the clients and the potential for settlements. So I think that's that's a, an issue that we'll probably discuss later on. And in terms of uh, what I've been missing, I guess, traveling, but not as much. Um, the ability to travel mainly, so the possibility of going somewhere, not the actual traveling time itself. And then probably, you know, getting coffee with colleagues and friends, and again, being uh, more sort of interactive, uh, that kind of spontaneity, spontane spontaneity that we don't have anymore. Um, so that, that's for me for now. Thank you, Leo. And so, Mia. Thank you. So I'm Mia Forbes-Perry. I am a mediator and I work mainly in commercial and workplace mediation. Um, I call myself a recovering lawyer because I used to be a solicitor uh, and now I'm, I sort of do something a little bit different. Uh, um, in terms of split personalities, I occasionally work a little bit with Jason and his team at Assurity helping to train witnesses. So that combined with taking mediation online has been just a huge focus for me during lockdown. How do we get everything to work as well as it possibly can in an online context? Um, what else can I say? What do I miss since lockdown? I think, I think most people have said things that I miss. I definitely miss hugs and shaking hands with people. I don't miss getting on planes. I was on planes pretty much every other week before lockdown and, and I really don't miss that. But I do miss, in a professional context, being in the room with people. Um, and I'm finding that online we can do really, really phenomenal things. Um, and I think I was probably a bit of a skeptic beforehand. I thought you could do simple mediations online, but I didn't realize quite what was possible and, and what was possible in terms of human interaction online. And still there is nothing like the side conversations you have at, a, at an event or when you meet people um, and being in the same room as people. So I think, I think on a personal level, um, I do miss that. So yeah, thank you very much. Do you want to kick us off with the first question, Leo? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we, we do have a sort of a structure of, of topics that we want to go through and try to cover uh, today. And I guess, based on what we've discussed so far, I think uh, perhaps the, the, the first thing is really to see how our sort of personal views have really changed from, again, in-person hearings to, to online settings and what has been um, the, the main, the, the main uh, advantages and disadvantages. I can just perhaps start by uh, drawing a, a comparison with France, because again, we are in a sort of Franco-British context here. And just on the back of what uh, sort of Lord Lloyd Jones said, in France, unfortunately, hearings haven't really gone uh, virtual as, as quickly as they have here in the UK. And uh, as it's been said, we've been very fortunate in, in England. Uh, France has been a little bit slower in that respect, but the good news is that as of now, uh, sort of scheduled hearings are going to take place in person going forward. So as, as all of you know, the second lockdown has sort of a slight different, uh, you know, impact on, on things and hearings are resuming now in France at various levels. So that's, that's very, very encouraging. Uh, but I guess Perhaps um, more than that, I would I would uh, 
uh, like to hear from the panelists what the uh, feedback from the other participants uh, in a hearing. So not, not only from the perspective of, of us advocates or, or solicitors, but also from the other stakeholders and, you know, from the perspective of, of, of clients or from the perspective of uh, uh, witnesses or experts, if you have uh, sort of um, feedback in, in that respect, or it can be too early for you. So perhaps I don't know if someone wants to jump in and um, give us uh, your your views on that, on wider feedback on online hearings. I'm happy to um, share some thoughts, Leo, because I've just uh, published or contributed to a chapter in a book that's all about remote hearings that's published by Clua. And as part of that, uh, myself and my co-authors actually did a survey of users. So including council solicitors, but also clients, in-house counsel, arbitral institutions, uh, tribunal secretaries, um, etc. And what's interesting is I think that end users are even more enthusiastic about the new normal than perhaps those uh, such as council who obviously are having to navigate things such as um, Lord Lloyd Jones has talked about like electronic bundles and adapting to a new way of advocacy when you've been doing something for a long time and it changes uh, then that can seem difficult to begin with but again I remember when the CPR came in in England and everyone thought that was a huge sea change and now we just see it as normal so yeah I think it's interesting but certainly there was extremely good feedback from um, clients and and as I say tribunal secretaries and arbitral institutions particularly in the area of case management so I think about 85 percent 90% of people said that those should actually stay, even if we get beyond this as being remote, uh, particularly where you've got different jurisdictions. And that was a very effective way also of the tribunal grappling with, say, expert issues at an early stage and case managing an arbitration more effectively. I think what you then see is a variety of responses depending on two things, the size of the dispute, so a dispute that's under $2 million, people think that, that the new normal may remain for resolving those disputes for reasons of cost effectiveness. Between two to $5 million, people are a bit equivocal, could go one way, could go the other. Once you get above $5 million, people start having uh, a tendency to think that an in-person hearing would be better when we can do that. Um, so I think that's very interesting. The other thing that the research revealed was that once you got to four witnesses, whether it was expert or lay witnesses, people started becoming more concerned about the effect that an online hearing had. And then once you got to six, people thought that that should be explored being in person again when we can. Um, and I think the final thing that people have expressed concern about because of how the technology works at the minute is something again that Lord Lloyd-Jones touched on, not being able to see everybody. So particularly if you're a judge or an arbitrator, and I should have said, actually, I do citizen arbitrate as well as acting as counsel, you often pick up a lot, not by looking at the advocate who's addressing you, but by seeing what else is going on in the room, particularly, I think, not when you're dealing with submission, slightly different, but with evidence. So, you know, often the faces of the other side will tell you a lot more about what the witness is saying or, you know, um, so I think that's a bit lost at the minute. Um, and it'll be interesting again to see if we can get technology where it's possible to see not just the tribunal, the judges and the advocates, but actually everybody else who's in the virtual room. Right. No, that's that's that, that's very helpful. Uh, and, and you touched upon witnesses. So I thought that perhaps Jason could give us a bit of his sort of views on on how witnesses are reacting to this new sort of uh, normal and uh, what's been the feedback generally. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's not just the, the value of the litigation that determines whether people think remote hearings are a good idea or not, um, particularly the, the number of people involved. And it's not just witnesses, actually. Certainly, if there are a lot of witnesses, I agree with Annalisa, there's a sense that um, you need to uh, have a, a, an in-person hearing rather than an online hearing. But it's also influenced by the number of other participants. How big is the legal team on each side? Uh, and who else is likely to want to be involved. So I did a trial very recently that was 
very high profile and attracted a lot of press interest. And the court had ordered that the hearing would be in person. We turned up on the first day to discover there were about 20 or so journalists present and they couldn't be accommodated within the courtroom in a socially distanced way. We actually had the door of the courtroom propped open and people lining up down the corridor um, trying to get in. And so after the first, well, pretty much as soon as we arrived, the judge said it's not possible to try this case safely because of the number of people who want to be present in the courtroom and it will continue remotely. So we were all sent away and then almost overnight it was turned into a remote hearing. So the number of people involved generally, I think, is a, is a, a powerful indicator of whether it's possible to do it in person or not. Yes, and one other factor, just to take into account from the perspective of other people before we talk about witnesses. So Annalise has talked about some, some really interesting research in relation to that. The one question I'm asked almost invariably by people that I'm representing, corporate or individual, is, is it in my interest to have this done remotely? Is it advantageous to me to have this case done remotely or should we be pushing for it to be um, in person? And that can either be because of the way in which they think the hearing will go, or sometimes even purely strategically. I don't want the hearing to take place now, and therefore if I object to it taking place remotely and insist that it ought to take place in person, have I got a better chance of it being adjourned off and buying some time? So people are using, if they have a choice, the choice about in-person or remote in that strategic way. I have to say now, certainly as far as the courts and tribunals in the UK are concerned, it's rarely the party's choice. I think in the early days, our views were invited about that and were accorded a degree of weight. Now the courts are pressing on and they're not really interested in, um, in the party's views about it. If they decide it's going to go ahead, it does. That's just sort of introduction. We'll talk more about witnesses in detail when we come on to that. But I can say that witnesses I've done in first instance cases, the, the, um, the experience has generally been a positive one. I think people prefer to give evidence from the comfort of their own home where they feel much more relaxed and at ease than they do giving evidence in person where they go into that strange world of the courtroom or even, even the arbitration room. Uh, they're out of their comfort zone. So they generally prefer the experience of doing it in a more comfortable setting. They think it's easier. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jason. That's, that's very interesting. And I think the, the notion of sort of being at home in, 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 you know, in your comfort zone and being able to sort of uh, address a screen rather than a whole room of, of uh, you know, arbitrators, justices or parties is, is, a, is a key element. And what about uh, in mediation, Mia? What, what's the, what, are, what, are, what are the key aspects to, uh, to these issues and how have parties and stakeholders reacted to this, to this new sort of virtual reality? I think in, in mediation, I think it depends on who the parties are. Um, to some extent. I think at the beginning there was, um, as Jason was saying with, with hearings, there was sort of more shall we wait. And at the beginning of, of the first lockdown, people were saying shall we wait and mediate when this is all over. And then there was this realization this is not going to be over anytime soon, so we need to move forwards. And then I think there's just the different parties with their different sort of uh, where they are and what they do. So I think it, I think sort of hard nosed commercial people um, seem to be more comfortable faster in this online environment. Whereas when you have more emotional issues, I think people think, oh, should we really be doing this? Particularly in the workplace context, if we're thinking we're dealing with an old issue that has emotional elements and we might, we might have to work together again in the future. Uh, will we be able to achieve that online? And I think the results have been surprising and surprisingly positive in that even those people who were initially nervous, we can help um, become comfortable and move through the process. Um, and we've had phenomenal results. Um, and, and I had uh, one matter recently, which was two co-founders who had fallen out and one of them was very, very reticent 
to discuss the matter online. Uh, and within the first five minutes, he just said, I'm so glad we're doing this. I feel so much better. So it's, it's quite surprising um, how well it is all working. Um, and partly, I mean, I'm very much enjoying doing it online, but partly I'm a little bit sad, actually, that I think I think it's going to be here to stay because I do like being in the room with people better. But I, I think it's working so well that we're going to um, be with this for, for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that one of the key points that I've picked up uh, listening to you all is really sort of uh, number of witnesses size of the dispute. So these are statistics, but these are really key elements that, that are uh, worth considering. And one of the things that I wanted to share with you perhaps is, should we reconsider uh, disputes without hearings? Because you know the, the main question could be also, do we not have too many hearings? And the fact that now we're really focusing on the technicalities of a hearing maybe should make us rethink the necessity of having hearing sometimes and of course this is limited to disputes in which uh, you know witness evidence is not uh, crucial or we don't need very technical experts to to address some issues so uh, th that could be something to to think about documents only arbitrations are they coming back are they worth considering again i don't know whether that's been an issue in your respective practices but that's certainly something that that's come up in some of my cases recently, and then we've decided not to go for it, of course, because we needed we needed testimony on on clear issues. But that's something that's come back uh, a little bit during these uh, sort of unprecedented times. So I don't know if you have any any views on that, or should we move on 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 the to the next uh, to the next uh, yeah topic? I mean, I I um, I'm a common law lawyer, so I've got my biases, but I think that you can't. <laughs> underestimate the power of oral advocacy. I think that written advocacy has become much more important with online hearings and you may find yourself facing an, a harder uphill battle if the judge has decided against you before they come in or the arbitrator. Um, but I do think there are still occasions when oral advocacy, if, if controlled um, in a suitable way, can make the difference. I remember speaking to a court of appeal judge after the Court of Appeal ended up having to abolish the automatic right that you used to have in England to come to court. And if your application for permission was turned down, you had an automatic right to have an oral hearing. And unfortunately, they're just so busy, they can't do that anymore. But w one of the Court of Appeal judges said to me, it is amazing how you walk in sometimes and you think there's no grounds. And then somebody persuades you through their oral advocacy. There's something in this block of papers that you've missed. There, there may, we obviously also have adjudication in England, which is uh, dealt with purely on paper, but that is only temporarily binding. I think I've also seen suggestions for ENE, early neutral evaluation. And Mia, again, my, my experience is very much, everyone loves, particularly clients, loves online mediations, but, <laughs> but they have also been asking for mediators with flexibility to also give their non-binding views on something where the parties have reached an impasse rather than, so I think that's interesting. People are looking a bit more flexibly about what options are open to them to resolve their disputes. I think there's a lot more flexibility with online mediation in general and in in terms of format as well there's a huge amount of flexibility whereas we were used to the sort of traditional one day sort of mediations um, and maybe they continue on a little bit afterwards now we have a lot more flexibility in how we set up and we often do sort of half day things which actually works better with people's business and with them not having to fly in from different places so i think flexibility is is a is a, is a key new thing in mediation yeah I, I just saw actually on the chat somebody was saying what new processes behaviors have you experienced online just going tying in with jason's comment as well um some witnesses prefer giving evidence from home. I have had witnesses who've been in their kitchen with dogs, children, uh, not able to work the technology, and it's been highly unsatisfactory, actually. I've also had people accused of having other people in the room. I've had examples of cases where people want cameras set up to check who else is there and helping. There have been some quite high-profile cases of lawyers 
being in a room together without telling the judge. So I, I think that's interesting. I think there are there are challenges. But I do one thing I do think that I welcome is aggression does not come across well on a screen. Uh, I don't think it comes across well in real life, but it's it's a different. I'm sure we'll come on to this. It is a different way of making points, both in submission and when you cross-examine. And, and perhaps you, sorry, you just mentioned aggression. So perhaps I'll, I'll hand it over to Mia to maybe uh, sort of address the new topic on human uh, aspects and the human element of, of online settings. I, I think, yeah, we should definitely move to the human aspect just to say, you, you, if your witness had been trained by a surety, they wouldn't have had a dog in the kitchen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, I also just wanted to pick up on what Annalisa said before, because I, I uh, even though this is not my main metier, I agree that, that oral, oral sort of submissions are, are, are really important. And I, I think they make a lot of difference, and particularly the ability to for, for, for judges, even if they have to raise their hand, to ask questions and to interact in that sort of live way, I think is is hugely, hugely important. And before, um, quite a long time before lockdown, I went to an event by Bailey um, on, on around the topic, I can't remember what the event was called, of taking justice online. And I remember being horrified at the idea <laughs> that everything would happen online and you wouldn't be able to see witnesses face to face. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I think we're doing very well. And, and as uh, Lord Lloyd-Jones said, Richard Suskin says we're doing very well. The Financial Times says we, we are sort of leading the world in, in moving online. So yeah, so let's, so let's, as you suggested, Leo, let's go and, and look at how are we making this all, the human element of this work and, and maybe starting with Jason, um, how are we making the human element of this work with witnesses? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? That we, uh, when we do things online, we see people in this little box and we see such a small part of the person. We do, depending on where they're sitting, get a little insight into their world. You can, you can look behind them and try and identify the books uh, on the shelves behind them. And that's as true of witnesses. You get a slight sense of the, of the person from their background that you wouldn't get if you just see them wearing smart clothes in a courtroom. But I think the two-dimensional nature of it does have the effect of dehumanizing people uh, to some extent. And that applies just as much to judges, actually, as it does to witnesses. So an interesting comment that Lord Lloyd Jones made about being able to see all of the justices on the screen at the same time. I had seven judges in the case I did in the Supreme Court. And whilst in person, those would have been quite terrifying, on screen, they were just inch, inch <laughs> square little boxes, um, putting their hands up in order to speak. And it does change the dynamic somewhat. Um, the, the judge loses to some extent a degree of authority. And I did a case very recently where there was a technical glitch that affected the judge only, so that we would be in mid flow. And every now and again, the judge would pop onto the screen to say that actually he'd not been able to hear anything for the past two or three minutes. Um, very, very sorry. So he became quite apologetic to us that the glitch was affecting him. Please could we repeat the submission or the cross-examination that we were just going through? And that did, does change the dynamic um, as to the level of authority the judge appears to have in the courtroom and who's really in control. The person that can best handle the tech seems to be the person most in control in, in hearings. And that's especially true when it comes to witnesses, because they are often the ones who are most disadvantaged by the tech. In the Supreme Court, obviously we're not having witnesses and the tech support is very, very good. And the hearing I did went without a hitch. Hearings involving a large number of witnesses that are being dealt with remotely pose real problems. We all know that you need more than one screen if you're going to do a hearing effectively online. You need at least the screen that shows the participants, the judge, etc., and another screen for uh, the electronic bundle. Um, witnesses often don't have that resource. They don't have the ability to have multiple screens up in their homes. They might not have uh, uh, an area that's conducive to giving evidence quietly, whether that's a dog barking in the background or a child um, coming home from school, banging loudly on the door, whatever it might be. So they don't necessarily have the right environment. 
uh, they might not even be able to use an electronic bundle. So a case I've got coming up, there are a number of witnesses who all of whom have said they don't have a second screen and even if they did, they wouldn't want to use an electronic bundle. Please, could they be provided with a hard copy bundle? That's one each and each bundle is multiple lever arch files. So tens and tens of lever arch files are having to be copied and provided independently to witnesses so that they've got something available to them. So I think witnesses really do struggle with the technical aspects of giving evidence online. In a way, of course, they don't have to worry about when they're appearing in person, they just turn up, bundles provided for them, etc. So that, that really is one of the features. And the interesting comment Annalisa made about the judge's ability to read the room. And we know Lady Hale uh, did a, a very short piece on radio recently called Rethink, and it was rethinking the justice system. She pointed out that one of the sacred cows of the, certainly the common law system, is the idea that judges can read the demeanor of the witness. And the demeanor of the witness is everything they're doing apart from the words that are coming out of their mouth. So that's watching their body language and it's watching the body language of those in the court. And all of that I think is lost when witnesses just appear pretty much a headshot on a screen. There are two schools of thought about it. However, I know a number of judges have said that that immediacy of, of having a full screen image of a witness where you really see the whites of the witness's eyes up close can be a much more intensive experience than seeing a witness at some distance in a large courtroom and to some extent you can read the features of the face much more readily than you can um, in a courtroom. But the general view is uh, you lose the ability to read a witness to everything other than the words that they're using. Um, and that's, as you say, the surety when we're, we're training people to give evidence, something we focus on, how to come across well and to get life and passion and meaning into your evidence where that's appropriate when you're just sitting staring at a screen and talking in, in this really abstract way that we all do now to the dot on the top of the screen. So yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting issue. Yeah, and I think that it's interesting, isn't it, that witnesses might feel better about doing it, but they might be losing out on that rapport they can have with judges. And going back to Leo's comment, therefore the witness evidence actually becomes far less important. I'm sure we've all seen cases where the witness goes into the box and is absolutely fantastic. And although legally it may not seem to affect the outcome, the impact that, that witness can have um, is very, very significant. So I, I agree with you, Jason. I think it's important to, to train witnesses how to still have that because it may be a false impression. They may feel more comfortable but actually they're having less impact. I think it's just some other points that... Some witnesses do also miss having the comfort of someone to support them. So I've certainly had witnesses coming into solicitors offices or chambers to sit socially distanced from someone while they're giving their evidence, just to have someone else there if they need technical assistance or they can't find something in the bundle. Obviously that's all dealt with and is above board and people know that there's a solicitor there with them. But obviously that's what used to happen when people gave video link evidence, when everyone else was present, they actually had to have someone else there with them um, as a sort of policing what they were doing or what notes did they have in front of them. Um, I, I do also think you can see expressions. I've also had judges and tribunal members making faces that I'm not sure I would have seen but when they're on the screen. They, they can actually be very expressive. And I think the final thing is this sort of access to justice point that, of course, one size doesn't fit all. And there can be real problems. There's been quite widely publicised concern about family hearings where you may have, say, uh, an alleged abuser and an abuser in one house rather than in a safe court environment and they're expected to be doing hearings and that sort of thing. I mean that's obviously an extreme circumstance but for cases that have less resource it's fine at the minute for cases that have a lot of resource they can train their witnesses with surety they can be well prepared but I think the resources that a party can put into a hearing now um, are going to be even more important because you don't have that leveller of being in a courtroom. So if you can pay for all this support and preparation, you may be putting put at a significant advantage over another party. I think that's right. I think. And can I perhaps just add? I think technology really cuts both ways because in some of my cases, for example, I've seen uh, the perception of a witness change quite a lot from a sort of 
physical setting to an online setting. And so, for example, you may have a witness uh, answering questions while he or she is cross-examining, looking at the screen of his cross-examiner, so counsel or the tribunal asking questions, and he's thinking of speaking to them, but actually he's not looking at the camera, and the camera is what really matters. That's the real sort of exchange of, of of, of eyesight and so the, our, the arbitrator or the, the, the tribunal may think that the witness is actually avoiding uh, the question or looking somewhere else. So there may be perceptions of uh, that, that are actually wrong and so tribunals may assume things that are actually not, not really uh, not really there and things that wouldn't really happen in real life. So there's, there's a shift and I think again sort of familiarizing witnesses with these issues is, is really key and I think that when that doesn't happen and it's really difficult to fix it afterwards so that's uh, and then the other point I was going to make I think just picking up on Annalise is the again access to justice and uneven access to justice so we do have sometimes witnesses that are just located in countries which uh, which, which are different right and so it's not necessarily a matter of of uh, means or access to technology, but it's just that perhaps now a country is subject to different lockdown restrictions than others, and so they may not be able to, for example, travel to a venue in which it would feel more comfortable giving evidence, or uh, again, it could be an internet connectivity issue, and so that would create a lot of imbalances in, in the mix of a, of a dispute or a hearing. So there's a lot of issues that I think can be actually addressed beforehand uh, by sort of agreeing all the details, all the sort of protocol for, the, for hearing that and, and all the potential issues that, come, come, that may come up. But it's impossible to think about everything. So. I, I, I'd like to pick up on a few points actually. I think, I think you're, you're right and with the sort of people being in the room and things like that, um, with my sort of a surety hat on. Um, I've trained people who, who very innocently have said things to me like, oh, that's a great point. I want to write it on a post-it note and stick it on my screen, which of course is not something that they're allowed to do. So, so very innocently. Um, and I've also worked with people where it was clear that someone had their wife in the room who, and they kept looking over. And so we had to make it very clear that that's, that's not allowed and, and that can't happen in the real world. So I think I, I'm a big fan actually of, of uh, people going to their solicitors or counsel's uh, sort of offices and having that extra oversight. And I think to some extent, it, it removes some of those access to justice issues because everything is set up for them. Uh, then, of course, there is a whole other sort of uh, lower financial level where where the, the lawyers may not have the setup available, and and so that those access to justice issues uh, still remain. And uh, just going on to the mediation point, I think Annalisa spoke about rapport between the judge and the witness. And I think building rapport in mediation is incredibly important. And it's, it's how we, we build trust with people and, and how they start to feel comfortable telling us what they need to tell us for us to help them resolve an issue. Um, and bizarrely, we found that sometimes it's easier to build rapport in this online environment. And I think there are two factors uh, that, that sort of contribute to that. One of those factors is that we get to meet more of the people who take part in a mediation at an earlier point. So often in, in normal times, um, solicitors or counsel don't really want to take up their client's time getting them to meet the mediator before the day, which is completely fair enough. Um, but with the technology aspect, we're more insistent on meeting people on time. And then we get, and then that brings me to the second point, which is we then get to talk to them about technology and nothing to do with the case. And so as, as we're sort of having the, a discussion in a completely non-threatening environment, talking them about technology, probably more um, sort of, in detail uh, about the process than we would normally. That builds a lot of rapport and a lot of comfort. And not just 
with the, the sort of participants. Also, sometimes I, sp I spent time talking with sort of former judges and uh, very senior counsel, and particularly towards the beginning of lockdown, I think more, more and more people are getting more comfortable with, with technology. Um, it was quite a leveler that I was helping them with things that they weren't used to and that they weren't comfortable with. And so, so the dynamic, uh, as we, we talked about, maybe the dynamic in the courtroom changing a little bit, the dynamic changed where someone who would normally be very comfortable in a solicitor's office um, is less comfortable with the tech. And so we build rapport in a much stronger way where I'm advising them on what lighting they should be using and where they can buy it uh, and things like that, which, which is sort of very friendly. So, so yeah, so building rapport has been quite easy online and, and surprisingly so, I think. Yeah. Um, the, I, I don't know whether it's sort of in, in terms of maybe we want to carry on this human thing and just talk about how, how we've overcome some of the I think, I think you guys have touched on it actually already in the court context, but in the mediation context, there are little things like sort of how you would normally knock on the door, open the door a little bit, realize when you weren't really welcome and shut the door and let people carry on and come back a bit later. All of those things and kind of reading the room is not as possible. So we tend to find ways around that. And the ways we might find is when we have people in breakout rooms, we might kind of type in the chat to them uh, is now a good time for me to come in so that we don't just appear out of nowhere uh, and in the middle of, of a sensitive discussion. So there are lots of workarounds and lots of things uh, that we've put in place that mean sort of like then we might check in. So how's everybody feeling in here? How's everything going? Whereas without that, we might just be able to look around the room and see. So I think there's, there's lots of things that we've managed to put in that make up for what we would get in a normal room. And, and yeah, and I, that's been one of the big concerns of clients. How do I tell my barrister that I want them to say something when they're remote? Uh, let me tell you, in a normal setup, they have to get through quite a lot of barriers to get to you in a real hearing. Whereas, of course, now everyone loves these WhatsApp groups. Uh, so I've received some interesting emojis from clients um, <laughs> during the middle of my submissions, trying not to laugh when I'm when I'm submitting <laughs> anyway or listening to the other side. But, uh, you know, I think there are workarounds for those things. I think that people have been very, very concerned about those things. But I think those sort of practical things are much easier to deal with than maybe some of the more fundamental things. And I think, Mia, just going back to your point, the problem for judges or tribunals is they can't build that rapport in the same way. Yeah. I think that's partly why having these interlocutory hearings, I've had one where we actually had the experts and the tribunal talking to the experts um, at a very early stage and that did build rapport because they kind of got to know the experts early on and by the time it came to the final hearing we were dealing with the real issues that mattered. Obviously with individual witnesses that's at the minute, I can't see a way in which that's possible. Um, but it's interesting, I think with experts, you can certainly have the same thing of more direct contact by the judges or arbitrators, which again goes back to a more civil law system that actually the experts should be there to assist the judge or the tribunal not to be an advocate for the party. Yeah. Just I, a quick comment, Mia, about... Um, the sort of interaction between the legal team. Uh, so WhatsApp has become the, the, it seems to be the default way of communicating, whether that's with witnesses or other members of the legal team um, when you're in a remote hearing. The first one I did, I thought it would, be, it would be clever to say you could email me. So if you've got any comments, email me. But that just meant I had to have my email on. And it meant all the other emails I was getting during the course of the day were appearing and trying to see the one from the from the, the solicitors was absolutely impossible. So we've all gone by default to WhatsApp and we set up groups. And it's important to remember if you're in court, often witnesses will be there present with you and you can ask them the little questions as, as they arise when you're listening to other witnesses. You can have that interaction with them, answer any questions they've got. So when you're setting up these WhatsApp chat rooms, important to make sure that witnesses are also included in that. Obviously, you can't 
and interact with them in a way that's inappropriate, but just to let them know that there's a channel of communication available if they've got any questions or if they need to make any points to you. And just one last thing to say about that. We're all assuming that WhatsApp is safe. Not, <laughs> not much thought yet has been given to, to cyber security, to the idea that particularly in the context of arbitrations that are meant to be held in private, um, what is being done to ensure the security of the online platform, the WhatsApp groups that we're setting up to have these privileged com conversations with? Um, and I'm not sure very much is being done at the moment, actually. There's an assumption that it's safe and we'll only find out it isn't uh, when, when, we, when we learn of interference in a court hearing because someone's been hacking into a WhatsApp communication so that's one just to flag up i don't have an answer to it yet but to be aware although of it. although even before we went online you know it was something extraordinary like they thought six out of ten arbitrations had been hacked in terms of just hacking into lawyers emails and reading the without prejudice comms so yes. i think there's a bit of a blindness and a bit of naivety um that particularly when you have parties with resources who have no compunction about doing that that goes on actually yes. a lot more than we think um, but I'm not sure how you police it. There have obviously been some very publicised cases about, um, you know, hearings being streamed out to people without without that being permitted or known by the court. Yeah. And that's interesting. Or again, in arbitration. Um, yeah, obviously, even bigger issues there based on confidentiality. But just with hybrid hearings, there's still a real problem with them for the High Court, because the High Court, the Coronavirus Act said that the Court of Appeal can now transmit, sorry, the Court of Appeal before could always transmit. The Coronavirus Act said you can transmit publicly on a live stream if it's fully remote. But there remains a bit of a loophole where it's hybrid, whether you can actually have, a, have it being broadcast out. Um, so I think that's something they've got to look at. But these sorts of things can cause real issues and concerns for understandable reasons. I think we should talk about hybrid in a minute. I, I just want to, on the security and safety, I mean, I think Zoom has put in place a lot of new measures to make it sort of more confidential and, and safer. Interestingly, and I don't know where we've ended up on this, I think WhatsApp is very safe as far as I'm aware, for one-to-one -one communication. But there was something about group chats being found, and I can't remember how, uh, and that is actually what the area of concern is, so we should probably look into that a little bit further. Although Jeff Bezos had his, it's very easy to um, get WhatsApp infiltrated, actually. Jeff, you know, Jeff Bezos opened a link, and then they, you can easily, there's spyware that can be put on just by clicking into a link that someone sends you. That's how Jeff Bezos got caught, just so you know. <laughs> I mean, obviously, they were looking for something else, and that's how they discovered what was going on in his personal life. But uh, anyway, it is incredibly easy to do, even though WhatsApp sells itself as being end-to-end -end encrypted, yeah. etc. Well, if he got caught out, there's no hope for the rest of us, is there? No. <laughs> <laughs> we all need to move yeah. the signal, uh, but... Which is which is Russian based, but yes, we, you were going to say something, Leo. Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, we are sort of twelve twenty, so I think Lord Lloyd Jones wanted to come back on the panel with a few comments on these very issues that we just discussed. So perhaps if uh, we can have him back and uh, sort of allow him to uh, give us his comments, I don't know if Sophia can do that. Uh, I can. I, I'm not able to do it. The second promote panelists, wonderful. Um, and and whilst we, we also have some, some questions from various people yes. for Lord Lloyd-Jones and for the whole panel. So, uh, but, but if you have any comments on or thoughts on what we've said so far, Lord Lloyd-Jones, please. You're still muted at the moment. I think you can unmute. I can ask yeah. to unmute. Whilst I ask, you're you're still muted. Uh, yeah, I've I've clicked ask to unmute. So so you have to click to unmute. We've decided this is the 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 word of 2020. Is you're still muted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're still muted. <laughs> yeah, we we can't hear you. Uh, Can you click unmute, Lord Lloyd Jones? Uh, 
Let's see if there's any other way that I can unmute, but I don't the think there's... Oh, there we go. Sorry, I lost the connection, I lost the connection for a minute. It's, it's, come, it's come back now. It's, it's we hear you now. Fine. Well, it's been fascinating to hear the uh, views expressed by the panelists, and it's given a real insight in hearing views from the other side of the courtroom from a uh, very different perspective. Um, I was particularly interested to hear what, what you've had to say about witness actions, something of which uh, my experience is now rather out of date. Um, as for, I was also <clears throat> interested in the observations on the power of oral advocacy. And uh, I entirely agree that this is often hugely influential in cases. And uh, I've certainly been in cases where I've been persuaded from a preliminary view simply by the sheer force of the, the cogency of the oral submissions that are made. Anna Lee has referred to something that's been missed you know, on, re on reading the papers, and um, oral advocacy can, can draw that out and emphasize the importance of it. And I want to reassure you that I don't think that is diminished in any way in, in a, a hearing which is conducted online. I think oral advocacy is just as effective in an online hearing as in a real hearing. I don't think that's diminished in any way. Um, there was a question from Ian Forrester who asked whether the process of deliberation was any different as a result of having online hearings. <clears throat> it is a bit different actually. Um, what, what happens in a normal hearing with us is that we always meet 15 minutes before the case starts and we have a preliminary discussion and um, we identify various po particular points that we're interested in and which points we might want to draw out during the course of the hearing and so on. It's very much a preliminary discussion. <clears throat> then during the hearing, of course, depending on how long it is, we um, have the opportunity to have brief conversations in the corridor outside court. Um, <clears throat> and then at the end of the, he the hearing, um, the end of However, however many days it is, it'll be at the end of the, the complete end of the hearing. Uh, we have <coughs> a meeting uh, in which we all present our views, starting with the most junior, I might say, uh, and then the next most junior and so on uh, on, on the case. Uh, <coughs> slightly different in the case of uh, online hearings. We, we still have a pre-meeting online, of course. Um, we often arranged to have meetings during the course of the hearing, so we'll have those diarised in advance. Um, that's a s sort of substitute for the conversations in the corridor. Um, but we then will have a, a meeting at the end of the hearing in which we will carry on in just the same way as we normally do. <clears throat> those de that delibere, the deliberations taking place there, are exactly the same as if we were all sitting in the same room. So I don't think there is very much in the very much different there. But I do have a question for the panelists, if I may. Can I ask whether any of you have ever descended to the Lord tadpole? Lloyd Jones, you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, can, can you unmute me? Um, <laughs> can I ask whether any of the panelists have ever descended to the tactic of selecting books on the shelves behind you in order to create a particular impression? Sure, you have. <laughs> I, a friend of mine owns a bookshop and he said there's been a remarkable increase in the number of people coming in and just buying handfuls of books and not at all to do with um, the, the author of the books but just how they look yeah i, 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 I don't i don't yeah I don't know if you also heard the story of um, Mr. Justice Butcher who was hearing the business interruption case who in one of the first hearings had a sheet over a painting behind him and there was a sweepstake to work out why he had put a white sheet over the painting. And then for the next series, he moved into a sort of study environment. So we still don't know what the painting was or why he had decided that it shouldn't be on the screen. But one day someone will ask him and find out. <laughs> um, cer like certainly well. those, those virtual backgrounds, though, I think have been discouraged. I know yeah, at the beginning, yes. it sort of makes you look a bit like a robot. Um, mm -hmm. So I think at the beginning, everyone was very kind of paranoid about having a white background but my own personal view is actually if you can see a bit of your life it makes you more human um in many ways but it it is important i think um again just as the way you look and appear in your demeanor in court i think sometimes matters um 
whether you're an advocate, a witness, or judge, whoever you are. <laughs> yes, I, I think those artificial backgrounds can work quite well as long as you don't move. <laughs> yeah. That's true, actually. I had an important experience. I, I, I was speaking and I had to propose a toast at the end. And I had a beautiful background of the Library of the Supreme Court behind me. <laughs> and at the end, I, I had a glass ready, full, and I, I raised my glass and my arm <laughs> vanished entirely off the screen. <laughs> I I have to say that I have scrutinized my bookshelf for any books that I wouldn't want appearing. Not that I have particularly dodgy books, but sort of books with pink covers and things like that. I thought maybe maybe not. <laughs> also client names on, on folders, those are that's a big issue. So we have yeah. to be careful about that because yes. some people may be able to zoom in really well. I'm not, but um okay, I I I I had a question for Lord Lloyd Jones of any particular bugbears of what people have done on remote hearings um, that you've been party to that we should avoid from the perspective of, of judge without naming names, obviously, but things <laughs> things not to do um, might be useful for those listening. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be a disappointing answer. I can't think of, of, of anything really. <laughs> All council have been perfectly behaved. Mm. Behave in a very civilized manner when when they. Can I ask about about yeah. the use of headsets, though, uh, Lord Lloyd Jones? I know that there's 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 advice from the Inns of Court uh, advocacy. I think it's one of the Inns of Court bodies now that advocates should not wear overhead uh, headphones because they wouldn't in court, and you ought to be as close as you can be in court. Oh, I, did, I, did, I didn't know about that. I mean, some can, some can sort of. I've, I've done that in court recently. I've noticed. Are they perfectly okay to use headsets. You're happy with that? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't see them. Well, of course, if our council says they shouldn't, then they shouldn't. <laughs> no, well, I was going to say I'm wearing them and I've worn them, and actually, a lot of the transcribers prefer it because it cuts out the background yeah. noise. Yeah, My yeah. understanding is that there is no problem. That that advice is not correct. I mean, it's not bar council endorsed advice. I don't think, but. Um, Certainly my experience of being in court or tribunals is nobody has an issue with it and often it's welcomed because the sound quality is better. Yeah. We have two minutes left. Yes. We have two minutes left. Yeah. Somebody's actually asking about witnesses who need a translator, which is an interesting issue that perhaps we should touch on. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone has any experience of having yeah. used translation. I actually do. So interpretation is, again, uh, a, an enhanced uh, potential problem in, in arbitration hearings. I've had a case in which we had two languages and there has to be a lot of attention to be really brought on, on how interpreters interact and the choice of the interpretation method as well is really key. So there's also something that comes after the hearing, which is the transcript. And when you have interpretation, issues potentially the the sort of transcript uh, verification process can take a much longer time so those are things again that may have an impact on costs and on the duration of, of the proceedings so, so a quick observation on that is that simultaneous translation can work can, can work really well just as effectively as it would in person but there's a, you need the tech to be able to do that properly and again i think that's an access to justice issue that those with the resources can organise very effective simultaneous, simultaneous translation. A lot of people at the lower end, in sort of employment tribunal cases, um, don't have the resources and, and uh, consequent uh, translation, so where the witness speaks and then what they say is translated, very difficult online and it slows down the process. Even Much longer, more. yeah. yeah. I think uh, in, in many contexts that, that can favour the witness, um, and and I'm reminded of uh, I don't know if you all followed the Beresovsky and Abramovich uh, trial where Abramovich had translation, and um, Lady Justice Liz, Liz Gloucester was very um, positive about Abramovich and and very negative about Beresovsky, and I and I wonder if Beresovsky had had the extra time that Abramovich had through the translation if he might have performed better. Um, I don't think it was to do with that, yeah, but yeah. you probably want that. to read Sumption's cross-examination of what Berezovsky was doing in certain London hotels, but there we go, that's the, yeah. the salacious <laughs> side. 
<laughs> I just want to bring in, uh, I know we're, we're at time, so I understand if people have to leave. If anyone can stay, I just want to bring in some of the questions that we've been asked from, um, from attendees. And um, Fatma Al Al Sayeh, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly, um, asks Lord Lloyd Jones, how long did it take for judges to adapt to the new normal of the judiciary system and any difficulties? Well, we adapted remarkably quickly. Um, we did it over the weekend, effectively. The last hearing in the Supreme Court um, was, I think, on the 18th of March. And by the following week, uh, we were up and running online with the, uh, the, the all, all the cases there after being heard online. Um, the main work, uh, the, well, there was a lot of work to be done on the technical front, and we've got a small but very expert technical team, so we were very well served by them. <clears throat> they did a superb job. Um, there was also the need to train the judges, but uh, a great deal was done over the weekend. We had rehearsals, and we were up and running by the following Wednesday. That's incredibly impressive. Um, I think we'll, we'll go to Simon Horsington has, has a question for you also, Lord Lloyd-Jones. It's a more technical question. Will video judgments and written judgments be archived um, as that's important? Um, yes, I believe they are. I, 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 I'm not entirely sure of this, but I believe that the uh, recordings of the hand downs which take place in normal circumstances in court um, are, are available and um, th that will also be true of the hand downs that are done online but in addition we also produce uh, press summaries for each judgment in the supreme court not for every case in privy council but for the privy council for, for the supreme court cases we also have press summaries and they're all available online as well um, I we missed a point earlier on uh, from uh, from another judge or former judge Ian Forrester who says European judges in Luxembourg will usually have advanced the analysis extensively before the oral argument. That's partly due to the French language and the formality of the tradition of exchange of notes en délibéré. Uh, partly due to the difference in tradition, several countries regard oral arguments as something quite close to a waste of time. <laughs> so intellectually, the weight of the judicial is more written than verbal by contrast to England. As, as, as part of the British legal profession, we disagree. <laughs> um, I just, I think I'd like to end uh, on two questions from Emma Sharp. Um, and perhaps we can sort of take them all together, all together. She says, what do we prefer about online court hearings or preparations for, for online? And uh, what new processes, behaviors, technology have we experienced with online dispute resolution that we would like to continue when we return to full in-person hearings? So something about the future and something about what we prefer right now. Perhaps we can end on that, just, just going round. So I should I kick off then? So um, I, I think like Lord Jones was, was wedded to paper bundles before we went online and I've had to adapt extraordinarily quickly to electronic bundles. And now that I have, I don't think I ever want to go back to the paper. I much prefer the electronic. Now that I know that you can highlight, annotate, bookmark and link, um, I find them much easier to use and much easier to get around. So yeah, the introduction of uh, electronic bundles far quicker than otherwise is something I'm very happy about. Uh, what do I love about doing things remotely? Um, being in my pyjamas, eating my breakfast sort of 10 minutes before court starts, uh, rather than having to <laughs> get up and go super early, I've found is a much more relaxed and comfortable way to get into a court hearing. So I like that. Thank you very much. You can't flick through electronic bundles. <laughs> Who would like sure. to go next? I, I, can, I can go next. So um, I would say that for me, uh, sort of electronic hearings provide, uh, and the whole sort of online context really provide for uh, obviously more access to justice potentially. So we're going to save in terms of costs and time. So that's a very positive um, sort of aspect. I think that one thing that uh, is still to be queried is really the potential for uh, agreements. 
out of court, out of a tribunal hearing. So how do we ensure that uh, online hearings allow parties to discuss and to have sort of parallel discussions about uh, settlement and prospect of settlement may be actually endangered by the fact that in arbitration, at least, we have very sort of tight schedules and not a lot of room for discussing among counsel and, and between clients. So that's, that's uh, sort of uh, a perspective that's worth considering. Um, yeah, so just adding to that, what I think has been really good, I think the diversity aspect actually has been very good. So I think for young arbitrators or young advocates, they can actually perform incredibly well, often better than some very experienced advocates. And I've seen some amazing performances and I hope that will kind of carry on and encourage people. Um, I think that I also have loved kind of seeing the human side. I love seeing people in their home environments. Um, lots of people talking to me about their children, children being on the screen, pets being on the screen. We haven't had any cats today, but on Tuesday we had a cat appearing in a webinar. And I think that's that's actually a good thing. And I have enjoyed being here for my children almost every night when they come home. Um, it's better now they're at school. I never want to go back to homeschooling, but it's been, it's been nice for them to share and it, you know, what I'm doing and the conversations, having dinner with them every night and them asking about what the judge has been saying and this and that, you know, they love it. It's great. So, yeah. Um, I think I particularly like not having to travel from a personal perspective and i think that's that's really great for a number of clients um, who can participate from all over the world and don't have to sort of come to a mediation jet lagged and tired um, so i think that's great there is also there are things that we can do online that we can't do in the real world and i think that's important to remember like switching off people's videos to focus on certain people or not having people go oh in the middle of, of people's submissions um and i think i think that can be a, a significant positive um and i think from the mediation perspective it's also really nice that in those down times people are in the comfort of their own homes uh, and they can go and get the kind of coffee or tea that they like. Um, and as, as Annalisa was saying, spend time with their children uh, and, and things like that, which I think makes the whole day less tiring for everyone. Um, so as I said at the beginning, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot going for online mediation and it's definitely here to stay. So, so we, we need to get used to it and also sort of in hybrid. And of course, Hello. we will hand over to you, Lord Lloyd-Jones, but thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> the one thing I don't miss at all is the daily commute to work, I have to say. I mean, that, that, that is a huge advantage. But on the other hand, I miss the companionship of my, and the fellowship of my, my colleagues at work. Um, now that I'm getting the hang of electronic bundles, um, I think I may stick with them. Um, it's certainly, they're very efficient in a hearing. Um, if you if you can move around the, if you can move around the bundle, the problem is if you want more than one page open at the same time. I mean that, that that is quite difficult. I think when things get back to normal, I'll still want to have copies, hard copies of the core authorities that I can mark up, and I think they will be really useful when I come to to write the judgment at the end. Uh, the other thing that I think will change and that we are likely to persist with is that I, I think a lot of privy council cases will be heard online in future even when we've got over the, uh, the pandemic and even when there's no necessity to do so, I think it may well be found um, that that's a good and efficient way of doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Lord Lloyd-Jones. Thank you everyone who's given up their valuable time to, to be with us and listen to us and ask us questions. I don't know if you want to say anything about the Franco-British Lawyers Society, Leo, before we close. As, as just uh, mentioned earlier, we, we do have quite a few events lined up. So please do join us if you haven't yet. And thank you very much for joining our webinar today. And we hope that this new format is working well and we're trying to improve every time.